<laughs> that may actually be a little bit too um, you know, over the top. But first off, everyone knows what this is. We can all read it together. This is the part where we get to do like, you know, back in the SAT land, and we get to go back to analogies. The title of the talk is Airplanes are to sailboats as mobile is to desktop, a story in two parts. Initially, I was going to make it a story in three parts, but it's really more like a ramble with slides, and you can stop me at any time and like, you know, tell me where we want to go. Some things that I included as part of the abstract that probably won't be included as part of the presentation unless you stop me and make me go wander off in that direction is things like wearables. Um, I don't quite know where we're going with this. And initially, when I put in the talk, I had some great ideas about this is the best thing ever. My thinking changed over four months, so that's also the evolution in here. And that's, you know, let this be a lesson to you. Write really, really good abstracts, but we were willing to train, you know, a little bit later down the road. Um, yeah, I mean, this all happens to everyone. Call for proposals comes out in like January, and you're like, duh, I have no idea what I'm going to write about. Like, what am I going to say? Like, all of that. And I got in the habit of writing really long, good abstracts that could basically be the proposal and the presentation in one when you got to like two or three weeks before and everyone was dancing around going, I haven't done my slides, I haven't done my thing. It's a good idea to have a long proposal. At the same time, the things that you thought back then may not be the things that you think now. So where we actually start is not me rambling about proposals and all of that. It's starting with sailboats. It's starting with the idea that sailboats were a tool that we used for a long period of time. And in some ways, they kind of made the world. But the ancient art of boating, at some point, gets on to the big, crazy sailboats of America's Cup, which I like a lot. And so this talk is a lot about sailboats. So you know, it's my talk. Welcome. If you want to give a loosely organized ramble on stage, you too can put in a proposal next year. You've seen it then before. So, I'm also going to talk about where we came from as far as computers. Um, no, I am not starting back at the beginning of time with the mainframes and all of that. Um, uh, Reed gave me crap about this earlier, and I told him that, again, it was my talk, and two, I was the one that had slides of Windows 95 in Spanish, because I figured that Windows 95 was a good place to be able to start from. You know, the dawn of modern computing-ish. But we're also looking at these various things that are coming up as far as mobile. Um, I am assuming and this may be a wrong assumption, that pretty much everyone in here has a smartphone. Yeah, whether or not we like it, we have them. <laughs> we have them, and they, they focus our world in different ways that maybe, like, do you remember what it was like to not have a smartphone? Yep. I don't. I don't remember what it was like anymore. I mean, I can, I can remember being, like, you know, playing 1990s house and looking for, like, you know, Wi-Fi wandering around. But I, what else was it like? What? <laughs> right? Point yeah. out directions ahead of time and then backtrack because you're in Massachusetts and nothing has changed. Right? <laughs> right? So uh, this is also me telling you that this, this presentation is not actually just me. This is sort of me leading things on to way and making you all play ball. Um, if you don't like that, that's you know expectation management. Here we go. But as I also mentioned before, um, my thinking has changed on this in some ways because initially I was very excited around, oh my gosh, all of these wonderful things are happening, all of these great things that we're seeing from our mobile devices that are really just you know sleek, interesting ways of being able to put information on a page or moving back over towards our websites. Um, you know, we're being able to think about like oh gosh, like search means this, and if I just put this little icon here, everyone will know what that means, and our affordances will be so much cleaner, and it'll be great. But what also happens in this is that you end up getting pages like this, where you can, has anyone actually visited a Gawker page recently? In like the last two months, probably. Right, like, you know, you can't scroll down, like it goes sideways, you don't know what's going on, like you press a button, and like strange things happen. Really? No, no, it's totally not you. No, that's that, that's that's how my my whole thinking has changed. And like the actually seeing this in practice, going like I have no idea how to use this. Um, it one, it can't possibly be me. Two, what the hell are they doing? So three, this thing happened. 
And it, it, it made me start questioning a few different other pieces around here. No? I mean, okay. No, no, I'm like, it totally did. What kind of a world are we creating where, like, something like this matters, like where you are so isolated from each other that you need an app to be able to tell each other, yo. Like, also, what were the other ideas they proposed and like, how was this one the good one? <laughs> I wanted to see like what fell off the table in terms of like the, you know, honestly, if this was your go-to, show me the other ones because like, this is just gonna be like an SNL skit. But uh, yeah, again, at the same time, I started looking at like the ways that things are actually being put together. Um, and how what we're creating actually tends to create the landscape. So, I'm also not the person to tell this story because I am not a UX person, I am not a designer, I am not any of the things that you should be in order to be able to do a foundational user experience talk. But it's my talk and I'm giving it anyways. And this also means that it's a story and I'm drawing conclusions and maybe you can follow along and you can also disagree with me and that's fine too. I've also had a number of different conversations in the past two weeks about imposter syndrome, which either tells me that there's a turning point going on where everyone's realizing like, oh, I don't have to be the person that has to have all of these things together in order to be able to give this talk. Or it's just summer conference season and everyone is realizing that you can actually come in and give the talk. I, you know, chicken, egg, back, forth. But, Turns out you can actually put this slide in your talk and everyone is fine with it. I don't see anyone running away yet. One of the other things that I do as well in most of my talks is also putting an expectation management slide. Um, and sometimes the wording is better than others. I think this one is particularly good. Um, right? Mm -hmm. So at this one, um, this talk has absolutely no data to it. There's no code to it. There's nothing. It should be fairly accessible. If you wanted those things, there is, let's see, um, a window manager talk down the road, and there's an automatic updates talk. And, no, I don't care. <laughs> um, but I like to be able to kind of set the expectations of where we're going, where we've been. If you were expecting something else based on the abstract, if I wrote it wrong and you're like, oh god, this is not what I came for. I don't know what I'm doing. Again, vote with your feet. Act one part about the sailboats and the airplanes, but the sailboats. I am assuming that most people actually know the history of flight, so I'm not going to necessarily go all the way through how that happened, but it'll all tie together. A short history of sail. I'll try to make this short, but in order to tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Again, we started off with being able to do boats. Boats will take us all over the world. They were the only way to be able to get from one place to the other. This is kind of like a Viking I think it's a Nor, I'm not really sure, but it's what we think of when we think of like the earliest boat. And this boat had a sail, and the sail only worked when the wind was behind it, which made the Vikings really great explorers, or they just got stuck in places all the time, because when you actually get to the point of where the wind is no longer behind you, how do you get home? <laughs> you get stuck there, so you're great explorers, but you're stuck in various places. Sure, you can tack back and forth to try to get back from there, but if the wind is just not running in your favor, you're screwed. But then there's an improvement to it. So we move from a square sail to a triangular sail, mostly. And then from there you can turn it around and actually get more of the wind. Other problem this kind of brings up, and it, it's kind of a feature, is if you turn it the wrong way and the wind comes the wrong way in, you just end up with like little bubbles and not actually a sail. I see vague nodding of like vague agreement and all of that, but this is how slight improvements happen over time. And this is thousands of years that I'm glossing over very quickly. From here, when we put both of them together, my God, we end up with, you know, boats that do things mostly. They get you pretty much wherever you need to go. You can carry people, you can carry things, you can create like the modern image of commerce for the time. And this is actually a um, painting of the three ships of Columbus. So kind of going towards, look, we have this new age of sail, we have this new age of being able to do discovery. This powers a lot of different things. It also powers things like the Royal Navy. This is the HMS Victory under sail. For the time, this is awesome. This is the best you can get. And it does many, many things great, but it doesn't go very fast. Now, I first thought about this particular kind of connection of airplanes to sailboats and mobile to desktop about five years ago. Because about 10 years ago, 
took some sailing courses in college. My sailing instructor kept talking about how we didn't get really good sailboats until we learned how to be able to do airplanes. And I was like, huh, you know, I never thought of it like that, but he's totally right. And all of the ways that I just laid out in terms of like, oh my god, like this sail is really just this airfoil up here. This was um, a, the anemone in 2002. And this is what normal, like, you know, we think of sailboats and this is what they look like. But with airplanes, we also get towards being able to have crazy sailboats. And these crazy sailboats do way faster than we've ever, ever thought about before. And it also causes things like this. Because, oh, um, I, I see people looking sideways at this and trying to figure out what it is. This is the America's Cup race at the point where the New Zealand boat caught wind in the wrong way and, te and tended to go up very high. You don't typically want that. Both of those should be in the water. That's, that's, that's bad. Both of those should be in the water. And this is, I think, the American boat. Uh, well, American is a relative term for that particular race. Sorry, inside jokes. But... It's just, all of these things are just tools. It's just an airfoil. It will only do what the wind is there for. It will only catch that wind behind it. And we've moved on to being able to have, you know, parts of a sail. Look, this is modern day sails is how this is. Everyone has the same words for them. They know how they're talking to each other. But Wikipedia says, and this is so, like, how would you describe a sail if you didn't have this particular language for it? Another way to say this is sails generate lift using the air that flows around them in the same way as an aircraft wing. Like, all of these things came together in my mind in terms of being able to think about the ways that we're looking towards our own designs. In practice, and I'm getting there, I swear, uh, we're, we're nearly done with the, the part of like, where I go wander off with the sailing, but all of these lines, the black lines are the good ones. This is where the wind is in a place where you can actually have the wind act like a wing. The one at the top is when you're, you, you, we still haven't figured that one out. Um, that one, like, the, well, the way that you figure it out is you put a really big sail up in front and you hope that there's maybe enough wind to be able to catch it forward. But that's what's referred to as being in irons. Nothing can move. The rest of these times is the way that your wings, vertical wings, and we did this by actually being able to apply all of the principles of flight back to being able to create more sail. Now, stop me if I'm going too fast or if I've lost anyone, or if you're bored. OK, fair enough. But one thing leads to another. And computers also let us do computational fluid dynamics. And this is what it looks like before airplanes. It's like, you know, it's a normal sort of thing, sailing rig, complication, interaction between sails. But you also move into being able to have rigid wing designs. And that's where we end up with the crazy sailboats. But I'll move back a little bit, because what I like about this is because, again, this is fairly complicated. And I, I just grabbed it directly. But it shows you how much more, mm, I, the word that I'm looking for is, again, complicated, but that's not it. There's many more pieces in this particular area. We've gone from something that's fairly simple and fairly easy to understand. Like, no matter how many sails you have, they all act in the same way. With where we are right now in terms of rigid wing design, you can have all of these understandings put together and they're not going to be simple. Like, there is nothing like the, the spin that came in last. All right, that's more or less the part about the sailboats because I've gone through, here's how you get the rigid wing designs and then what happens when you have those rigid wing designs. Again, I've, I've gone through my sailboat part, we're good. You know, my, my story and, and that side is done. But fast forward towards the place where we have desktop. And again, I, you know, the Spanish Windows 95 is the place where I wanted to start because it was the point where you could interact with the, a screen and have it mean something rather than just being able to do cursors. I thought about going back over towards like, um, you know, Apple IIEs and, and being able to type on a screen but this is where you have kind of the first point of being able to say, hey, look, Winamp. You remember Winamp? Like, some of the stuff that we're using today, all of it's still coming together. And in practice, Mosaic. 
and what that looked like. We, we got the idea of, okay, these modern patterns that we had, like stop signs or you know the refresh being like a little spinny icon, which is almost close to a recycling button, and you know we'll, we'll you know we'll carry it along from there. And the house means going home. And does anyone? Hmm? Back and forward. Right? Yeah, back and forward. Um, I'm trying to think of what this might be. That might just be like you know something that I've forgotten or never touched. But mail is still the same. And you know the, the the early world of the World Wide Web. So I went back and started thinking about where we'd been, and I started back with you know 1999, going back to Yahoo, and trying to remember. Okay, why was this built in the way it was built? Well, nobody really had broadband at that point. Like, still on dial-up? Most people on dial-up wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, like, when did broadband actually come together? Like, do you remember, like, when you got broadband first? When was it? Right. Like, you know, kind of that weird space where, like, okay, we know these things matter, and we know everyone wants to be able to go search in these things. I, I thought about doing the Google homepage, but that's that's not meaningful. You know, there's nothing there. No, that's not true. Google was 1997. This is 1999. Sorry, I mean. That was me just also like, you know, like Google had made the decision that all you're doing is searching. Yahoo never made that decision and said, let's work on being able to direct people towards where they're going. Um, right. You're totally right. I, I don't know. I'm remembering the front page. Um, what other things do we remember about 1999? I know, right? <laughs> Well, right? Like, and that was a major thing. And like Yahoo Auctions? Right. Like these things are just starting to happen and we're like, you know, the, nowhere in here is there anything around, I mean like, you know, win six days in Hawaii with Family Guy. Wait, so Family Guy was on in 1999? So says the Internet Archive. All right. You know, um, that, that's actually like, Internet Archive becomes interesting later on. Right. Not so different for 2004. I mean, OK, they're still trying to direct people towards certain things, but auctions are still up there. You're still looking towards like organizing things, but we're kind of moving beyond like Yahoo Mail at this point. Um, mail isn't the biggest thing. Where before it was over here, now where is mail here? Where, where am I supposed to find mail? More right? More ads. These things are like people are getting more um, bandwidth. So you can design for things like Yahoo Pool, I, I, you know. Not really sure why, but news still matters. Um, like marketplace, not really sure what that's all supposed to be. It's kind of like a collection of random things. Oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, sorry, I just said the news was depressing. Oh, well, I mean, it's always depressing, so, you know, move on. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what other things have changed between like 2000, you know, four ish. Well, so the next one, weird things start to happen because when I bring this up, Internet Archive actually got redirected over towards a non supported browser Flock, Opera 9, Safari 3, Firefox 3, Internet 7, optimized by Yahoo. Woohoo! Why would they be redirecting over towards a different domain? It, it's trying to redirect me to the mobile domain. Do you remember when this came out? Everyone was a little, we, we knew about it. Like um, the, the recent research that I read on it was like four out of 10 Americans knew what the iPhone was before it was released, which is remarkable. And the way that it was presented was, hey, this is more than just having a computer in your pocket. I'm thinking about other ways that people talked about it. Do you remember, did, did anyone have a friend or did anyone get the first iPhone? Yeah? What was it like? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And a friend talked about, like, this is the worst phone I've ever had. It's the best computer I've ever had. And just thinking about like how that all kind of came 
that was it. Everyone was like, you know, this is something that we're all going to end up having, because we did. And this was part of the marketing. This was only the beginning. And they were right, because again, weird things started to happen in terms of the Wayback Machine now can't find it. It goes like, ah, I don't know where we're supposed to be going. And when you do actually go over to m.yahoo, it doesn't look anything different. But again, as you were saying, like more ads um, brings you into more graphics, more focus around the visual aspect rather than just text. No one's looking at it in a browser that's going to be simply, you know, here. Get it as fast as possible. We're now going to think about the ways that we do it. Um, like these have now been added up in here. I still can't find my mail, uh, you know, like, right? <laughs> um, but it's sort of like the, are you going to the home page to be able to see what's going on around everyone else? Typically. Other amusements include, I have no idea why this is, like, this was something that they were even doing, and I just randomly like the, what was this? Yahoo Toolbar, you in? Like, things that we were thinking about in terms of, you know, strange things the internet could do. Um, and this was back in, let me move back. Um, yes, December 2009. February 2012, again, it doesn't look a lot of different. And, I mean, again, mail has moved down in there. Um, still, it's the same kind of focus around we have changed the way that we want to be able to look for things. And same for last Sunday, when I was pulling all these things together. But more ads, more focus around white space, more changing around what it is that we think people are looking for. And the point of all this is redesigns tend to happen. Um, when you look for mobile design, um, this is like it's focused around Facebook, and Facebook is the thing that is majorly driving a lot of this mobile design change and how this is all coming back in. Um, people expect to be able to see things from Facebook kind of coming across in there, in some ways, creating a lot of the design patterns. Um, I also didn't notice that 20th Century Fox had a song, but <laughs> anyone know what this is? That's a song? <laughs> oh well, I mean, uh, um, I, I don't know if it was going to be that. I don't know if it was going to be useful that comments anyway. So you know, um, but one of the things that I also wanted to kind of go back at and look at was Lifehacker. Um, this may have been something you all looked at when it first launched. I know it was something that I was majorly in love with, at, like the early part of the web, um, and sponsored by Sony was something that I didn't notice at the time. And now I do, just because I am now more aware of being able to see how these things are coming back in, things that are coming on, on through, which at the time wouldn't have made any difference. But this was reasonably like, able to navigate as far as desktop goes. Not sure why they have the huge white space going on, but then they went back and redesigned. All of the Gawker properties now look kind of like this. Um, again, we were talking about before, I have no idea what I'm doing here. It goes in the strange directions. It wanders off. And there's new design pieces here, like this terrible hamburger menu, which can be good and bad. But if you don't know what it means, you're lost when you see it up there. When I click on the hamburger menu for um, Gawker, this is what really happens. It's telling me that I should be joining a discussion rather than actually finding a menu about what else might have been here. And my point being, we're not all the way there yet, because when Design patterns like that are, are something that people implement. And you expect, as someone that's been on the internet a long time, that I can reasonably find my way around. And if I can't find my way around, there's nothing wrong with me, and there's something wrong with it. And I don't know if everyone has that experience of being able to say, there is something wrong with it and not with me. And our tools matter. Because improving all of the boats brought us great things, the British Empire and all of that, but it also brought us colonialism, conquistadors. You know, there are two sides to every story in this. And as we look at how all of our mobile pieces are coming back, are we giving it to the right people? Currently annoyed by the anti-patterns of being able to say, hey, look, if you just put a search icon up in like, you know, a magnifying glass, we'll signify a search to everyone because everyone is on Mac. 
not true. Sometimes they say, that's something else. Maybe that's a zoom in focus. Maybe I should be zooming in. I don't know what I'm doing. And are we privileging a certain class of users when we're doing this? Are we saying that only the people that have had experience with Mac and with iPhone and Android are the people that should be coming and actually looking at our designs? And what happens when the people that make all these things speak the same language? Because we haven't thought about you know, what other people would be expecting. And this frustrates me because, again, what would be the landscape where we would create something like this and think it would be a valuable focus for us? Like, where are we going where something like Yo would be the most important thing? I mean, you know, it's, it's, one, I, it's one dumb news story, but I think it was kind of you know, tying everything together for me going, huh, I wonder if we're making the right decisions. I wonder if we're doing things thoughtfully or if we're wandering away in a way that you know, we're only thinking about ourselves when we design, and we're only thinking about ourselves when we release. And as a project manager, I tend to think a lot about that. So that's all that I had, but I wanted to be able to wander off and see like what other things are coming up for folks, because again, I don't have all of the answers here, and I certainly don't know if I can facilitate all of this, but you know, What's coming up? So it feels to me like uh, you know, the arrival of the, the web is really a bust with respect to UX people. At least uh, something that worked out. We have a lot more UX people now. Like, oh, now we have two properties. So clearly we need to have at least one person on the payroll who can figure that out. Right? Uh, I don't know that it's made things better, but <laughs> it's definitely like got two properties. But at least you know, we're doing it poorly. At least we have that work to do to do it right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm noticing that as well. Um, I recently changed companies, and for the first time in my life, I have somebody on all my projects that their deliberate role is a um, experienced analyst. Like, and really, their job is actually taking the things that a lot of like the lead dev and the project manager would have done before in terms of like the no, how are we thinking about this? No, really, like where where are we putting these things together? And they help kind of keep everything aligned. And I've never had this experience before, um, and it's been. It, it's interesting, and I can't believe that I haven't had it until now. Just having like an analyst around to be able to say, no, this is where like the experience needs to be as far as what we're going to release. So I, I agree with you. Yes, go ahead. Both of you are getting to the point where if you stop and think about what you're doing, you can use sort of like new design to actually support older laptops and stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, fun. It's got built-in responsive design, which means that we can do mobile really easily. But I look at it, I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm that person that holds on to their laptop for like eight years and doesn't want like the retina display because then things are too tiny. It's like this would actually work for, you know, like an older screen resolution. Mm -hmm. Right. The always older browsers. <laughs> you look thoughtful. Go ahead. Right? Right? <laughs> and it's also funny in terms of like the there there really are still places in the US that don't have broadband. 
Like, it just doesn't exist. I mean, you know, honestly, like a large part of the organ coast in some ways, like you go out there and you lose cell service and you're like, wait a second, if I have lost cell service, there must be a few other things that aren't going to work out here. Um, and so thinking about, you know, how you design for like a really low bandwidth situation as well. I don't know. I, yeah, I tend to think about it because I tend to have like that. There's plenty of things out here. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. Oh yeah. Um, I've been thinking about easier to start like monitors or devices, but with like progressive enhancement and like regulation and like having the restrictions be really tiny and mm -hmm. like it just won't be fine. Like we have a data storage, but <laughs> at the same time we have the like, storage and all this like really bad stuff you can do with a little device. So I find it kind of brings like stress to either side trying to figure out oh, what do I do? Like I'm not really sure who to target and how to target. And then you have to figure out like what decision do I make in terms of like the do I screw over this side, do I screw over that side, how do I find the happy medium? Like and then once grandmother user testing. But that's why you do user testing. So you're like, oh you're right, like I made the wrong call on that one. Whoopsie woo. Like, you know. And then you can go back and fix it if you have user testing in terms of, you know, uh, before we release, we're going to do a small amount of user testing to see that if I've made the right decision, I get a chance to fix it. If I release it and I've made the wrong decision, then it's like, you know, right? <laughs> it's just how low do you go? Right. Or how high do you go? Right. Oh, again, we don't know where the happy medium is yet. If you are, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Well, but yeah, also thinking. Our, yeah, no, I know. We were like, I knew that was going to be. A <laughs> Right, yeah, no, it's being able to get like the right personas in a way that's going to work for the project that you're looking for without making like the direct assumptions of like the, my mom could never use this. Actually, no, my mom has a degree in educational technology and is usually smarter than I am about a lot of that stuff. So, um, you know, making that kind of assumption is not going to serve anyone if I do that. Um, and, you know, that's the other rabbit hole of like, you know, getting into persona development. Um, but still valuable. I don't know. We have about 10 minutes to wander off. Story time. <laughs> Do you want to tell sailing stories? I could. I mean, there was this one time where we did break the mast off of 36 foot New York in the Columbia River, and that was fun. But. And it's fun again, you know? In the same way as like, you know, knowing that you were building something just, you know, in Flash that was only going to be like, you know, available for a certain amount of users. It's not it's it's satisfying in terms of being able to build good work, but it's not as rewarding in terms of knowing that you don't know where it's going to end up. With something like again, Flash, you you you're pretty sure. Versus, you know, when you're building a like a mobile app or um, kind of like a, a headless API, which then can then go out and other things. You have no idea of like who you're going to find that's going to be your users in the next two or three years. Um, that's what I'm seeing now over in my world is thinking about how we decouple um, you know, data and design and how all these things come together and being able to say, OK, we're starting from this particular point, but we know that there is a long trail around um, you know, being able to connect in desktop and mobile and tablet, which you know, I mean, tablets, gosh, where did those come from, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right? 
It's expanding. It's expanding. And it, and it, and it curve makes change shape. Mm -hmm. But it's not like shifting, right? It's just right. expanding and maybe they want to focus it a little bit. Like, oh, where's the menu? Oh, it, it is this Right? Yeah, and being able to see like the, you know, we want to be able to focus on a certain like, you know, the two inch screen or whatever it is, but there's also like a bunch of like the 27 inch monitors. How many of you, like anybody have 27 inch monitors? Yeah? Bunch of them. Yeah, like, you know, right? And then sometimes you'll see people that have three 27 inch monitors, right? Well, one of my coworkers actually turned it vertical so he can code on it and he does like four different windows and he, he just kind of goes nuts every day. It's pretty great. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Right? You don't really need to have all of that space, even though you think you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know we discovered with our like, main site design that it will grow and shrink, but it will only grow so much because if you do have a 27 inch monitor and you're not looking at it in really good font, you don't actually want a line of text right. that stretches from one side all the way. Mm -hmm. Because that becomes hard for humans to process. Right. It, it's cluttered in a way that lacks scale, which is a weird way to be able to think about it in terms of like the, the like you can put things on a page and they will just be like if they can expand or whatever. They lack the scale of how they're in relation to other objects. Other things. Yeah, but they also made iTunes, so don't, you know. <laughs> it seemed like there was a push to make things simpler, cleaner, less heavy in terms of processing the, the UI and some of the graphics. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I never really figured out that it was, it was specifically probably people were getting too candy store with so much graphic stuff and trying to step back a bit, or what was, what was really driving that? I don't know if I know the answer to that. I mean, I can certainly make something up, but does anyone actually know the answer? Mm -hmm. And all the apps then would behave that way. Android was not like that, but that's what I thought after it was so intuitive. But once you need one app, it's like, well, you need all. Ultimately, they designed the, the framework and uh, it was made this really easy for choosing and going just for making apps as opposed to needing to be musicians. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I was thinking about like one of the reasons that I actually got into the web at some point was because I got tired of doing large Department of Energy cleanup sites um, and realizing that some of the work that I was doing, like, you know, nuclear waste can actually kill people. Um, and initially it was like, oh yeah, websites, websites are fun, like no one dies, everything's great. And now I'm going like, I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, project manager for large cleanup things, like, you know, all of the Gantt charts and all of the government, you know, back and forth and like the draft and the final draft and all of that and like um, being able to put all of the um, project plans together for how we're eventually going to clean this up. But a lot of it was also like playing um, Magic the Gathering with various um, agency rules where you had to figure out which agency rule would trump the other agency rule and how long you had to plan out for and I, the structure of it was exciting but the actual sort of you know day-to-day -day work was not actually that entertaining as far as like I I wasn't hooked into it and for web what I'm now seeing is things like the healthcare.gov site yeah okay it's not like you know life-threatening but it's actually fairly important we're starting to get to the space where like there's some stuff in here where we can't just take it like uh, you know oh it's just your website <laughs> no this, this matters to people it really does so that was that was also the impetus behind this talk. So yeah, and we are mostly at time. So I can hang around for story time individually afterwards. So cool. Thank you all. Thank you. Come here.